Good morning. I want to go ahead and get started, please. Um, it's my pleasure to, um, to, to have a chance to sit up in, in front of you again. I really question Nikki and Tim and the team, did you really want to have uh, a little bit of me two days in a row? And, and they said, well, not really, but if Bill Walton's here, then it, it would be, we'll, we'll put up with it. So uh, it's my pleasure to, uh, to, to welcome and introduce Bill Walton, uh, managing member and co-founder of the Rock Point Group, a global real estate uh, private management firm that has, um, that he's personally been involved with investing probably uh, over $50 billion um, over, over his career. He's responsible for the overall operations and management, investment decisions. Um, he previously was a co-founder and managing member of, of, of Westbrook Real Estate Partners um, and um, started his career at Morgan Stanley. Um, he, uh, he didn't go to the University of Florida, but at least his uh, undergraduate has the same colors. He was a Princeton grad um, in, in the orange and blue, uh, really kind of a local, uh, local guy, grew up in the Jacksonville area. So um, maybe I'll tell a, a, a quick story. I have known a Bill and an admired Bill, um, and perhaps we had met briefly, but certainly wouldn't have remembered each other. And I was in California um, one, uh, one January, and I was having a flight to New York where my offices were, and it occurred to me that I was having to fly directly over Phoenix, Arizona, and I was flying from San Diego to New York. And the significance of that was that the University of Florida was playing Ohio State for the national championship. And I said, I don't know what kind of gator could possibly fly over the stadium and not stop. So with no notice, I quickly changed my flight and flew into Phoenix with no ticket and no, to no hotel room for what turned out to be a fantastic game. So I was running around chasing scalpers and finally found a place to stay and got a ticket and ended up at a tailgate function. Again, I was just on my own and you know, looking to just, uh, as, as Dave and Sven know, I crashed their tailgate parties now and then. And, um, so they said, well, you know, Bill Walton from, uh, from Rock Point is here, and he runs a great tailgate. I said, well, I don't know him well, but let me go see. And so uh, sure enough, he was there in his, uh, in his colors, and, and we shared a fantastic moment of that, uh, of that great win over Ohio State. And, uh, and that's when our relationship really um, began to take off and we got to know each other. Um, Bill, uh, after, uh, after uh, finishing Princeton, ended up uh, uh, attending um, Harvard Business School, um, He's been, uh, at one point in time, I think one of the claims of fame was with the, one of the largest lot developers or the largest lot developer in the United States through their, through their funds. Um, he's been very active in, in the state of Florida, I think over $2.5 billion worth of deals, 15 or 16 uh, by count um, across multiple sectors. So a lot of Florida connections. Um, he's, uh, he's, he's really a, a stalwart and has a fantastic reputation for those of you that, that, that don't know it firsthand and uh, just delighted to, uh, to have you with us, Bill. Thank you for, for joining us. Thanks, great being here. So I thought maybe we would start off for, for those that, that haven't had the pleasure of, of meeting you or don't know much, you know much about your history, if you might just talk a little bit about your journey. Uh, was, was real estate an accident? Were you, were you, were you born into it? Um, you know, how, did, how did you get started in your real estate? Uh, sure, I, I grew up in Jacksonville. Uh, and my father was a small-time real estate developer, primarily single-family residential. And um, I remember going to work with him on Saturday morning. So by osmosis alone, maybe the industry was starting to take. Um, when I got old enough to ride a bus, um, I took the three Ortega to downtown Jacksonville to the 30 Moncrief, and I went out to um, some of his residential developments, this is probably age 13, 14 years old, and worked as a maintenance man. And when I uh, was 16 and could drive, I actually uh, started building houses. Um, these were subdivision houses, and I'd take plans, and I'd bid them out and talk to the trades and um, ultimately decide who to use. And then over the course of the summer, I'd build, build houses. So I'd, I'd like, um, I didn't probably at the time know how much I liked the industry. Um, I went on to college. Coming out of college, I worked at Arthur Anderson, the late Arthur Anderson, and um, you know, probably uh, wasn't as career focused then as I became, and decided I wanted to sort of repot myself and start over. And I, I went to Harvard Business School. And the summer uh, between years of Harvard Business School, I worked at Kidder Peabody, the late Kidder Peabody again. You know, there's a theme here I <laughs> hadn't focused on. Uh, but uh, I had a terrific summer. Um, 
I, I had become intrigued by investment banking, but when I heard Morgan Stanley was going to sort of restart their real estate business, they hadn't hired anybody since 1973. I got out of business school in 1979. Um, I applied a, for a job there to try to bridge my interests in investment banking and real estate. And so, as Tom mentioned, um, I worked for 15 years uh, in Morgan Stanley, most of it on the advisory side. In the late 80s, Morgan Stanley got in principal businesses, first private equity and then real estate. I was involved in that. And then um, you know, in 1994, I had this idea. Um, and I think always in the back of my mind, I wanted my own company and I wanted to be an entrepreneur. And so um, I approached a guy by the name of Julian Robertson, then some of you may know, he ran Tiger Management, which at the time was one of the preeminent hedge funds in the world. And uh, it was at a time when he wanted to institutionalize Tiger, make it less reliant on him. And uh, we set up a partnership um, to basically go in the real estate private equity business. Um, for a variety of reasons, it didn't really work out. One of them is the liquid business, liquid investment business and the illiquid business are very different. The liquid business, you can you know, look at a piece of paper, 10 deal points and decide you wanna buy it and change your mind in the afternoon. And the illiquid business, you know, we go back and forth for weeks, if not months, trying to factor in all um, potential outcomes. So we uh, uh, separated from um, Julian, a great start. And I'm forever indebted to him. In fact, I go see him several times a year still. He's um, in his 80s now. And, um, you know, we uh, originally, as Tom said, we were Westbrook partners. And then I had some philosophical differences with the partner I invited to join me out of Morgan Stanley. Uh, there was a buy-sell in the Westbrook name. Um, my partner lost the coin flip. It was my choice whether to buy his half or sell my half. I thought it was a lot of money for a half a name. And so five of the six partners uh, at Westbrook and most of the domestic acquisition team continued the business as Rock Point. You know, Fast forwarding till today, we, as Tom said, we've done about 50 billion of acquisitions around the world, uh, probably 360, 70 deals, and um, you know, we think we've got a good company. That's great. It's interesting. I, Bill made the point about the liquids and liquids being kind of uh, poor bedfellows in my organization, which is a investment scale in the hundreds of billions of dollars, about 85% is in the public liquid markets and 85% is in real estate, private equity and infrastructure. And the, um, you know, we always have people trying to, trying to fit the, the illiquids and the private markets into the kind of the public uh, templates. And it, uh, it makes for, uh, you know, constant, you know, constant challenge and in, in communication issues. Um, so uh, again, just in terms of the dates, the, Rock Point was founded in what year? September of 2003. 2003, right, okay. And um, kind of how do you, how would you describe your role uh, at Rock Point today? How many offices you have? Were you focused domestically or domestically right. internationally? Um, at at I, what I would call our peak, um, we had offices in Boston, New York, Dallas, San Francisco, uh, Tokyo, Singapore, Frankfurt, and London. And after the um, financial crisis, um, we decided to withdraw. Um, what does that mean? Basically, we exited the international business, you know, for a number of reasons. You know, we think it's a lot more difficult, but honestly, too, we weren't doing as good a job uh, internationally as we were domestically. So today, um, we have primary acquisition offices in Boston, uh, which covers the uh, East Coast, which is fundamental to our strategy. We have um, an, an important office in San Francisco. And then in Dallas, um, originally uh, our general counsel, well, general counsel is still there, successor general counsel, and we ran asset management out of it. But today it's more accounting, uh, risk and liability management, sort of back office. So long-winded answer. The real answer is today we have major offices in uh, Boston and San Francisco. And are you responsible, do you oversee all those offices or do you have kind of uh, lieutenants that oversee those? Yeah, we're, um, I should have mentioned it, we're five partners today. Um, I, we have uh, uh, a partner in San Francisco that r really runs the business day to day, um, a fellow by the name of Barak Shaleb. We have another guy in um, Boston who runs the East Coast day to day, a guy named Tommy Gilbain. And then my primary partner is a guy named Keith Gelb. And, um, 
you know, most of us sort of know what we need to do day to day. It's largely, you know, once we've raised money, and that's an important part of the business. Um, our investors are from around the world. Uh, we have sovereign wealth funds. We have publics in the U.S. We have endowments, foundations, and some very wealthy individuals. But um, basically, you know, once we're good to go, and we're just finishing up fundraising right now for our fifth Rock Point fund, um, which is actually our 10th fund overall, um, when you go back to Westbrook and include those. But, you know, day to day, you know, we know what our charge is, and that is to try to, um, you know, buy uh, great real estate with uh, fixable flaws. But, you know, Arik knows what he needs to do in San Francisco. Tommy and the team in Boston know what we need to do. And so, um, you know, I personally am not uh, arguing office rents with uh, people in offices, but before we make any investment decisions, before we make any new strategic decisions, I and my primary partner, Keith Gelb, are integrally involved in all of that. And in terms of scale, the first uh, Rock Point fund was 900-ish, mm -hmm. and then you're currently, what, what sort of size, what was for, and what, do you, what would you expect for the fifth fund? Uh, the current fund should end up um, at uh, $2.6 billion dollars in the main fund, it was, had a target of two and a half with an overrun of 5%, so 2,625. It looks like we'll be there, and it looks like we'll be there by the end of the month, which is when our fundraising is over. But in addition, um, fundamental to our strategy, uh, there have been times we could raise a lot more money than we ever took. And um, what we've tried to do is sort of bridge that gap. So we have, call it a two and a half billion dollar main fund, but we'll have a billion dollar, uh, what we call sidecar which when we find deals that uh, need more equity than we're comfortable putting in uh, the deal from the main fund, we'll draw on that. So, and in some cases we have, and the sidecar has what's called an opt-out provision. In some cases the staffs at some of our um, investors really don't have the time or the personnel to underwrite a fund, uh, an investment over you know, several months, and, but you can figure out if you don't want to invest in a deal fairly quickly. I mean, it could be concentration reasons or internal reasons or whatever. So uh, that actually has an opt-out provision. In some cases, we've been given discretion. So we have right now, um, you know, call it three, we should end up with um, close to $4 billion of purchasing power in our opportunity funds. And I should have mentioned earlier, we've recently started, um, in the opportunity funds, we shoot for mid-teens and doubling the equity um, because we think one of our greatest strengths is our acquisition network, which I alluded to a second ago. People that are embedded in markets know the players. Um, we all have the benefit of being in an inefficient, fragmented business, and there really are opportunities to buy things off market. But this acquisition network that we're proud of, um, we're seeing a lot of deals that on a risk-adjusted basis were as good or better than our mid-teens opportunity fund deals, and yet the returns weren't high enough. And so we recently set up, a couple, three years ago, what we call a growth and income product, where we're looking for net 9, 10% returns uh, with no more than 50% leverage. Um, reality is, Tom and I were talking about this, this at breakfast, the opportunity funds have a 75% leverage limit, but we haven't been using it. Um, we've been more sort of mid-50s, and the growth and income product's probably been mid-40s. So two products, two buckets, but the same acquisition network. And, and from my view, um, you know, I think we were in 155 funds or something at one point. Um, it's unusual to have an opportunistic manager that has a, uh, a, a lower risk um, kind of sidecar, uh, whether growth and in, growth in income or value add or core plus, whatever you might consider it. So that is, um, there are a few organizations that are doing that, but I think that's one of the things that, that differentiates uh, your organization. And um, it's interesting, the, the mindset of the folks that are, that are doing the higher risk investing and the mindset of the people that are more in that middle category are typically very different. They're very different personalities. The compensation systems are different. We'll talk about that a little bit. Uh, so again, it's uh, two interesting, um, really two interesting business lines. And um, it's a, uh, potentially a diversifier, but there's a lot of debate in the industry about whether it's a, it's a good thing or, or, or bad thing. Bill, we talked about the capital you've raised, and we've talked about the timing a little bit, but I don't know that the, the audience necessarily has a sense of, of kind of deal size and sweet spot. I mean, are you doing 
you know, a half a dozen or 10 mega deals? Are you doing a lot of small deals? I mean, how, how do you think about your portfolio construction and what, um, you know, what do the trends look like in terms of the projects that you're looking at? Right. Um, the sweet spot for our deals is probably 50 to 75 million of equity with, you know, call it 60% leverage. Um, but we've also done much larger deals. I think the largest deal we ever did was um, almost 500 million in equity, where we put 125 million out of the fund and um, 375 million dollars out of the out of the sidecar. Uh, the uh, as our strategy has evolved through the years, and I should have mentioned this that we're focused right now on markets that are defined by uh, supply constraints, could be zoning, could be geographic, could be uh, capital markets or limiting, um, real demand, identifiable underpinnings uh, of real demand, uh, scale and liquidity, uh, not only ease of entry, which is our choice, but ease of exit. And that, that leads us today to um, primarily the Northeast, uh, Boston, Washington, New York, and even then these markets fall in and out of favor. Uh, Southern, Northern California. Um, we've done a bit in Florida, mostly South Florida. As Tom mentioned, we've done, I think, 14 deals, um, aggregating about two and a half billion dollars of equity. Uh, we've done a bit in Seattle, and we've done a bit in Hawaii. Um, in terms of products and the opportunity funds, we're biased towards um, office buildings, urban hotels, and multifamily residential. In the growth and income fund, the lower risk, lower return fund, it's more office and, and multifamily. And maybe, I mean, you started with uh, deal size. Uh, as we've gravitated to these larger gateway cities, the deal size has gone up. I mean, there was a time when we'd routinely do 20, 25 million of equity, and if it's compelling or it could lead to a series of deals at that same size, um, you know, we would do it. But the sweet spot is probably 50 to 75, but um, if you do a lot in New York, you're going to be writing much bigger tickets than that. Well, I've been impressed with the loyalty of Bill's um, uh, investor base. When I was at Servers Capital, which is where I was before I moved, moved to the, the Middle East, we did a, a large deal together, and we took, uh, took private a, a large military base um, that was about do you remember what the acreage were? I'm putting you 3,600 right. acres. 3,600 acres, and originally zoned for about 3,500 housing units, and that was up zoned to 9,600. 9, 9,600. Um, and that was large for Cerberus, it was large for Rock Point, it was large for us to do together. And uh, they had a collection of, of, of just um, you know, platinum uh, public funds and, and uh, university endowments that they could go to. And so, again, um, they have a broader reach even than the, the the two, three, four billion dollars would suggest, which was, which was very helpful and uh, a, a long, a long, complicated deal, um, but uh, one that one that was very interesting. Um, so we talked about sectors a little bit. One one of the questions that came up, and I can't take credit. I, one of the young guys that works for me, I said, you know, um, I'm going to have an opportunity to interview Bill Walton. And I said, look on their website and see if there are any themes that jump out. And, uh, and he did, and he came back and he said, you know what, I don't understand. He said, there's a lot of emphasis on downside protection. Um, he said, they're much lower leverage than most of the opportunity funds, but they're winning deals and they're generating great returns, and I'm not sure how they're doing that. So I couldn't answer the question. It's not even my question, but I'm gonna pass <laughs> along uh, my associate's question. So uh, what should I have said to him? Yeah, well, we're about 70 people in the country. Um, again, three offices, Boston, Dallas, and San Francisco. And about, of those 70, probably 30, 35 are what we call acquisition professionals. And any one of the acquisition professionals can, can generate a deal. But you know, different um, managers have different strategies. Some of the mega managers um, uh, pursue what we would call macro bets. Um, I think other managers um, you know, see uh, country opportunities or product opportunities on a large scale and their strategic advantage is being able to write large checks. We're sort of a, a tweener and uh, we can write, write big checks, particularly after we've incorporated the sidecar vehicle and incidentally if we needed even more beyond that, um, given our investor base, we could probably raise it as well. But um, I think one of our greatest strengths is people. 
a lot of the managers in our space out there today are built around you know, one or two large personalities, in some cases, egos. And when we uh, continued the business as Rock Point from Westbrook in 2003, we tried to sort of uh, reestablish you know, the philosophy of the company. And one of them was you know, lots of fantastic people. I told Tom this morning at breakfast, and this wasn't false modesty, I couldn't get a job at Rock Point today. We have really tremendous um, young people, and any of these people, you know, after they've learned the basic processes and our way of thinking and underwriting, and incidentally, I do think that the way we do it is teachable. And so we want, you know, great people, but ultimately, the great people make a difference when they're out in the markets, they're meeting real estate owners and developers who have um, deals that they want to recapitalize or sell, um, the best deals ever for us are the ones that um, have dysfunctional ownership, uh, they're cash starved, meaning they haven't uh, put money in capital expenditures or they've been cutting corners in marketing or, or whatever. And um, you know, we would like to, as I like to say, trade non-economic factors, structuring, speed, reliability, um, to get you know, economic benefit. So when you have people in the markets talking to uh, owners and developers that control real estate, and they have um, you know, a problem that they want solved. And I think our reputation is that we're tough, but we're fair, we're reliable, we'll actually do what we say we'll do. That leads to deal flow. You know, I mentioned to Tom at breakfast as well. Um, I mean, there are deals that we track for years and um, establish a relationship with the owner. You know, if it has some of the attributes that I mentioned earlier, you know, it often you know, comes your way. I think, too, um, and this has maybe been the biggest surprise in the lower risk, lower return fund, is um, we don't think other managers generally are as aggressive as we are in being able to extract value. And um, you know, we also think some owners are less aggressive in getting all the value they can out of their real estate. So you know, on the surface, we've been, you know, and we prefer, of course, not to participate in auctions. Um, but we do occasionally, if we think we have a perspective, maybe everybody else doesn't. But on the surface, we might be buying for a normal, you know, even uh, aggressive cap rate. But what we're far more interested in is where can we take the asset in two, three, or four years. This growth and in income uh, product, incidentally, will be paying quarterly dividends that started out in the mid fours, probably 5% now, and, you know, continuing to increase. Um, so, uh, the short answer is we've got great people in the markets talking to a lot of people that control real estate. So we were talking yesterday, and at least in my session, about kind of the absolute values, the relative value of real estate. And so, you know, if you compare to the equity markets, I mean, a 5% dependable coupon is still not a bad thing. I mean, real estate holds up quite well on a relative value basis, particularly as, as, as returns and, and uh, current returns have been driven down so much across, uh, across so many asset classes. Um, I'm not sure um, you can punt on this if, if, if this is too hard to do, but uh, when I was at Cerberus, we, uh, we officed at 299 Park, um, which was a Fisher Brothers building in, in New York City. And I remember that Rock Point came in, and the Fisher Brothers were, you know, it's a great old line uh, New York family, and, um, but they had really, really convoluted ownership that I never fully understood. And I think we tried to look at it, and I couldn't even understand it. And somehow, um, you developed a relationship with the family. Somehow you ended up um, investing at what seemed like a, a fantastic basis in that building, and then that turned into kind of multiple deals with that. And I don't know if there's, you know, a few sound bites from that that would be, that would be takeaways, but I guess the, 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 the point of my question is that this isn't just, okay, here's a, you know, here's a building, let me go, let me go um, uh, buy it and, you know, put some, some lipstick on it and, and I can sell it for more, but this stuff is, the, the, the real value uh, add is, is complicated. It's complicated at the asset level, and it's complicated um, in terms of structure. So I was thinking maybe you could give just a little bit of, of insight. Um, I still never understood it, but hopefully you can explain <laughs> sure. it better than that. Um, <coughs> excuse me, I'm going to cough. <coughs> Sorry to blast you out there. <laughs> um, no, the the uh, 299 Park Avenue, which is the building just south of the Waldorf, was owned half by the Fisher Brothers and half by U UBS, albeit in a subordinated, um, honestly not that marketable structure. 
And this was coming right out of the financial crisis where, as I like to say, we'd been spending most of our time under our beds. But, um, and incidentally, we will not invest unless we have confidence and conviction. Um, I think some managers take the view that um, if investors give them money, it's their job to do the best they can irrespective of how they feel about the market. And so it's our money too, and if we don't have confidence and conviction, we don't invest. Um, that's not to say we don't make mistakes. But anyway, uh, you I, I expressed some cynicism about that yesterday in my comments, but <laughs> fortunately you weren't here for that, so. Um, but, it, but anyway, the uh, UBS wanted to sell its interest in 299 uh, Park Avenue, you know, one of the great locations in New York, maybe even the world. Uh, but it was not really a liquid uh, position because of the subordinated position that I, our attributes that I mentioned earlier. And so um, we went to uh, the Fisher Brothers and said, um, you know, we'd be interested in this position. And if, if we end up with it, um, we'd like you to be our partner. And oh, by the way, we'll give you a promote along the way. A promote meaning basically equity incentive for um, outstanding performance. So the, the short version is we were able to buy um, half of a Park Avenue office building at about $540 a foot and um, a yield of somewhere north of 8%. Now granted, this was coming out of the financial crisis and the markets hadn't got hot again, but, um, and we were still honestly a little squeamish at the time too, but the ultimate analysis despite you know, reams of computer runs was uh, Park Avenue, $540 a foot, eight plus percent yield. How can you go wrong? That's downside protection. And, um, and it sits over a, a subway um, entrance. So there's, there's stairs or uh, escalator right underneath it that connects into Grand Central. So you've got all this tremendous uh, transportation link. So in inclement weather, uh, you're not but, really outside. But we, we had a uh, terrific relationship with Fisher Brothers, they owned another building just up the street, Park Avenue Plaza, west side of Park between 52nd and 53rd. And again, at the time, there was a lot of focus on um, uh, liquidity. People were still uh, squeamish coming out of the financial crisis. And they said, you know, that works so well. You guys are terrific partners. You know, let's negotiate a deal for you to buy half of Park Avenue Plaza. And so the, uh, uh, that was uh, a, a different set of underwriting dynamics, but basically we bought that for about, I think, $570 um, dollars a foot. I think the yield was five, five and a half percent, but the tenant occupying the top four floors was going to roll, and it was going to take it to seven percent uh, really quickly. And um, you didn't ask the question, but sort of emblematic of uh, how important relationships are to us. Ultimately, we, through the Fishers, once again, we were able to buy half of 1345 Avenue of the Americas. That's the west side of um, 6th Avenue between 54th and 55th and another building, 605 3rd. But um, you know, a good example of trading um, non-economic uh, aspects for um, other things. They wanted certainty. They wanted a good partner. They wanted to continue to manage. I mean, things that we were comfortable dealing with and uh, we were much more focused on the economics. What about um, the perspective on term? I mean, do you still own some or all of those? And you know, the Fisher Brothers' perspective, I thought, was that they wanted to own assets, you know, generationally. And if you've got a finite life vehicle, was there any any tension in terms of the perspective holding periods? Uh, not really. We had, um, and don't hold me to it, but I think we had um, provisions where we couldn't sell within certain periods of time. Um, you know, in the case of 299 Park, uh, you know, values went up quickly in New York. Incidentally, our holding period in the old days in the Opportunity Fund was, call it, four, five, six years. As we've been more focused on assets that have um, identifiable but fixable flaws, the um, holding period has been compressed. But there was a nice pop in New York City real estate values, and 299 Park, when it went from um, our purchase price of 540 a foot to about 1100 a foot. You know, we said we're out of here. Incidentally, one of our um, guideposts is um, what we call a rebuy analysis. If you have an opportunity to sell something um, and you don't, you're rebuying it at that number, and you've got to make sure that uh, you're getting paid for the risk and return that um, going forward. So. Uh, the Fisher Brothers, you're you're right, Tom. Uh, they didn't want to trigger any. Um, tax uh, uh, 
issues for themselves. So, you know, we ended up selling that piece actually to the state of Alaska. And um, Park Avenue Plaza, uh, we sold our half uh, to the wealthiest woman in China um, or her children. And uh, 1345, uh, 605, we sold to a managed account at JP Morgan. Uh, but in all instances, um, you know, we tried to be sensitive to the Fisher Brothers' uh, sensitivities and constraints, but not impede our own ability to get out. Well, my perspective looking at it from the sidelines is you did, two, you did really three things. You, you made a, a good timing decision in terms of when you invested. You made leasing and operational improvements in each of the buildings, and probably none of those neither of those two are a surprise to anybody, but I think the other thing that's worth noting is that you bought structures that really put significant discounts on what the value would worth. If they bought 50% of a building and you knew the building was worth X, the 50% the wasn't 50% of X, it was a discount to 50% of X. And um, you know, oftentimes people try to sell uh, structures with challenges and encumbrances, and if it's 30% of an asset, you know, and they, we know if you can agree on what the asset's worth, they want 30%. And, um, you know, there are typically non-control or minority discounts, or can be structural discounts, those type of things. And so you've done a good job, I think, of arbitraging those opportunities, fixing those things, as well as the real estate. So there's been, you know, there's been legal structuring, and, and what you sold was much more marketable than, than what you bought. Absolutely. Uh, in, in addition to the, you know, the, the real estate dynamics. Um, it sounds like a, we've talked a little bit about how significant uh, Florida investment has been. We've talked about a number of New York City deals, and we've talked about some of the other offices. Are you active internationally? You had offices in, in outside the U.S. I know that some of those have been pulled back. Are you, do you look at deals outside the U.S., or are you more U.S.-centric now? Um, we made the conscious decision around the time of the financial crisis to get out of the international business um, <clears throat> for a number of reasons. We were <clears throat> much more comfortable in the United States we didn't think we were doing as good a job internationally as we were doing in the United States. And so we made a proactive decision <clears throat> to suspend that business. You know, today, um, we do look at international deals, notwithstanding that in Rock Point Four, the fund we finished investing six or seven months ago, we had a 20% international cap. We invested none internationally. And Rock Point 5, again, this is the opportunistic product. The core plus product, lower risk, low return, is exclusively the United States. But we, in the opportunistic um, funds, we look at international deals. We particularly look at London. Um, I think it's going to be a long time before we go back to Asia. Um, I think we'll start in London. And to the extent you know, we have more confidence in Europe, you know, we might look at Europe. You know, I would say also, too, our approach is <clears throat> based on our you know, resources and our outlook. That's not to say there won't be others that don't do great in Europe and Asia and, and other places. But, uh, you know, we're, we're a little um, cautious about the world today. And, um, you know, we have very high bars for all our investing. And that leads us to, primarily to the United States. I mean, even today in Europe, um, you know, they're talking about deflationary pressures. They're talking about ongoing quantitative easing. Um, you know, China's currency is going down, which is effectively quantitative easing. So um, all that, we're not economists, but uh, that and a number of other things sort of signaled to us that we should be cautious and we should do what we think we do best. Great. There's one other topic I'd like to touch on before we open it up for questions. I, I do want to leave a little time in case people, it's a you know, great opportunity to have people <coughs> here. And, um, you know, I've, I've, I've met a number of people last night, uh, dinner at a cocktail party, and, you know, there are a lot of people that are operating um, businesses of various sizes and, and with, with different focuses, some of the principal business developers, um, investment managers, um, but, but we all are running businesses. And so I thought maybe kind of touching on how you think about, uh, you know, talent uh, attainment, uh, retention, succession, just kind of the the people part of the business and how you keep people motivated, how you think about retention, because uh, I think some of these things are, are, uh, would be interesting to, to most of us in the room. Right. Um, well, as I mentioned, when we continued the business as, as Rock Point in 2003, um, we made some very conscious, fundamental changes in how we were going to change the business, and a lot of it revolved around people. Um, as I mentioned earlier, there are lots of models of companies like ours that are sort of centered around a, 
um, you know, one or two people, and the um, you know, staff is uh, largely commodities, and in many cases, they shift in and out um, on a regular basis. And we made the decision to hire the absolute best people we could at every position. Uh, we pay them well. Uh, there are five of us that own um, Rock Point, the you know, ultimate entity. But beyond those five, there are another 15 or 16 that participate in, in the promote. And the opportunity funds, um, basically, if we do our job, we get 20% of the profits. And while the partners, of course, have the most significant share of that, we've got another 15 people, young people, um, that do participate in the profits. And incidentally, most of them also invest alongside us and our investors, which is a, a great selling point. But as, as important as compensation is, and you know, we pay them, we think, um, you know, nicely along the way. We give discretionary bonuses at the end of the year, and um, we're all working primarily for this incentive compensation. But as important as you know, the compensation and the cash is, um, we have a view that you know, great companies are built with great cultures. And um, you know, I'd like to think you know, we've got a good company. With, you know, we treat people fairly. Um, you know, we, I think we have high standards in how we conduct ourselves. So combination of culture, and um, uh, it mean, including you know, being a desirable place to work, as well as um, nice pay, particularly if we do our job well, that helps us hold the company together. We've had very little, in 22 years, we've had very, very little attrition that wasn't management's idea, which maybe means we're paying them too much. So if I grabbed a 33-year-old from your company and ask him or her who she or he worked for, you know, would they say themselves, their, their, their partners, the, the senior partners, the investors? What do you think, to, how would that be? I think they'd say Rock Point. Um, we're not really hierarchical. I mean, sure, we have you know, st internal structures and way of doing things, but um, you know, it's a pretty flat organization in terms of interaction. Um, you know, we're not silos. Uh, any information that can be obtained from anywhere on the outside or inside based on prior experience of other people is all there to access. Great, I'm, I'm, I'm conscious of time and I wanna make sure I leave a little bit of time. Um, I think the guys have some mics. Do people have a question or two that they would like to ask Bill before we run out of time? We've got bright lights in our eyes, so if your hand's up, we may not see you. Um, in case anybody's trying to um, get up there, what about, is there one? Okay, yes. uh, Charlie. So yesterday, you were talking about the positive deal about the U.S. military economy. Well, I was just kind of uh, wondering. We've kind of gone through a, a a strong period of recovery since the the, the Great Recession, and uh, is your view looking forward in the U.S. that it is getting? You know, what's your view? For 2016 and 17, as you look back over the last two or three years, which has been um, a significant uh, improvement of demand in, in real estate. Um, our, our, a fundamental underpinning of our approach has always been cautious, caution, the downside protection that Tom mentioned. And um, we've chosen to, rather than lever up, uh, to try to make our money at the as asset level. But we've, of course, benefited from the tailwind um, that you alluded to. Um, I uh, personally, I think um, what we've been through the last five or six years is not going to continue. Um, we've had uh, you know, six, seven years of easy money, yet the economy you know, sort of limps along at, at 2%. Um, I mean, fortunately, the real estate business is a big business, a fragmented business, inefficient and all that, and there are various markets. Northern California, of course, is on fire, though the detractors would say, you know, we're in for a tech bubble burst. burst. But, um, you know, New York City, uh, one of our main markets, is uh, slowing down. I mean, rents are sort of stabilizing. They've been going up for a long time. Uh, the New York City hotel market um, is a mess right now. And um, that's for several reasons. You know, as the dollar has gotten stronger, it's um, 
I think, pushed out some international travel. Uh, Air, Airbnb is a massive disruptor in the real estate business right now. Um, it's my understanding there are about 100,000 hotel rooms in New York City, and I think the Airbnb inventory is about 15,000. Um, and that's making a, a big impact, particularly when the, uh, the market is full. But, um, you know, for us, it just doesn't feel like um, there's a lot of economic traction there. Um, it varies by the markets, but, um, you know, we, we, uh, we're always raising and lowering our bar depending on our confidence conviction. And we, we think now more than ever um, is the time to be cautious. Um, you know, it just, and incidentally, you didn't ask the question, but we, when we retracted into the markets that we did, basically the coastal markets defined by demand, liquidity, and, and um, supply constraints, that, implicit in that is, you know, we're just not interested in tertiary markets because, you know, we don't think they're going to have anywhere near the growth. But um, long, short answer is um, we, we don't see the kind of growth that we've all benefited from, you know, the last four or five years. And incidentally, and Tom can speak to this, you know, much better than I, but you're seeing back up in credit markets right now. Um, in the U.S., uh, you're seeing, um, you know, uh, CMBS, uh, the, uh, and you, you know more about this than I, um, you know, having to retain you know, some of what you sell. Um, I mean, you're seeing Goldman, I read this morning, is trying to sell a $2 billion deal and they're having trouble. Uh, the credit problem in China is supposed to be $5 trillion. I mean, there are a lot of signals out there, and we're not an island. I guess 15, 20 years ago, we were 42% of the worldwide GDP. We're probably 20, 25 today. But, what goes on in the rest of the world has a big impact on us. So if we're not really growing and the rest of the world has um, its own set of issues, it just tells us we ought to be really cautious and not count on the tailwind that we've all benefited from. Just a micro question. I, I met several multifamily investors and, and developers here uh, over the course of the conference. Um, are you still optimistic? Does, does the multi-sector have, have legs to go? I see that, you know, the the agencies are also having some credit yeah, issues, yeah. so there's going to be some disruption in some of that capital. Yeah, I mean, multifamily's been on fire, but of all the products, that looks like it still has legs. This is an old number, but the U.S. needed about a million four uh, housing units a year, and we had a long number. That's both multifamily and single family, and we had a whole series of years. We were five, 600,000 a, a year. Um, you know, with uh, credit incentives that the government put in, housing ownership went up close to 70% in the United States. It's now slipping back down into the low 60s. You know, those that used to have houses are now renting. But when you look at all the products um, in multifamily, demographics, you know, continue. Multifamily is probably still one of the best ones out there. It's also very competitive, so it's hard for us. Right. Well, either we're choking or out of time because I'm getting this signal. So um, I think uh, I'm, I'm hoping that's just that we're out of time. Um, Bill, it's a, a real privilege to, to have you here. Uh, a Jacksonville kid, uh, done, uh, done great, a big Gator fan. Um, it's a real pleasure to have you here. And, and thanks for, he didn't get in until midnight and is coming right out. So Bill is, uh, is just in to do this and share some time with us and want to thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.